first of all, uh, it's a great honor for me to be at this conference. So, I, for once, I, s I decided to act more responsibly, and I've somewhat reduced the scope of this talk. So, we might not actually get to fundament what I call fundamental local equivalence. B basically, let me just say in words, the story is like this. So, the fundamental local equivalence is a basic local ingredient one needs to formulate quantum Langlands, but that happens on the Durham side of Raymond Hilbert. And basically, due to time constraints, I decided to stay in this talk completely um, on the better side of Raymond Hilbert. So there is an extra story going on, maybe on some other occasion. All right. Um, so let me begin. So let me remind you the usual geometric satake. So let's say we start with a curve x and, and a point, and the, and the story will be completely local around this point. And just to introduce the notation, so I consider the group scheme g of x is the group of arcs and the group of loops g of kx. And one considers the affine Grassmannian, which is the quotient. So let's say everything is taking place over some algebraically closed field. All right. So in the usual geometric satake, one considers the following category. So one considers perverse sheaves on the affine Grassmannian that are equivariant with respect to g of x. It's a geometric analog of the, of the spherical Hecker algebra in the theory of Piatti groups. So this category has a natural monoidal structure. So in the basic theorem, which is known as geometric satake, reads that this, well, as a monoidal category, it's equivalent to the category of representations of the Langlands dual group. All right, so... <laughs> this is both in the Berti and LR vehicle. Yeah, so the, I'll, I'll, I'll say that in a moment. So, yeah, there's a bunch of comments I need to add. I just want to make sure which order I'm saying them. Um, I already forgot the first one. Uh, what's the first comment? Yeah, so... First of all, well, as we can see, this category is not just monoidal, it's actually a symmetric monoidal category. What, what one can do, well, in the process of the proof of this theorem, one promotes the um, monoidal structure here to a braided monoidal structure. One introduces uh, a commutativity constraint that turns out to be symmetric. Okay, now, what context is this in? So what do we mean by perverse sheaves? I'll comment that on that in a second. So basically, this is true in any... <coughs> in any of the familiar contexts. So one can do elladic sheaves working over an arbitrary ground field. So in this case, um, this is a QL linear category and we understand g check as an algebraic group over QL. So, but it is important to have QL, so FL doesn't work or that? Uh, it does. So it's, it's also true with FL coefficients or ZL coefficients. Yes, okay. So let me see. All right. So another context is one can do... So if the ground field is, is a characteristic zero, one can do D modules. So in this case, um, if we call the ground field K, this is a K linear category. And this is also um, uh, an algebraic group over the same field K. Or one can work over the ground field being complex numbers and one can consider sheaves in the classical topology. And in this case, one can take as coefficients, in fact, any ring, any commutative ring. 
so but in for the purpose of this talk we'll take field coefficients so over c So this but also there, is there any Faraday's condition like progressives are constructible usually and so you maybe want to take a, a, a just a piece of the Grassmann, not the, it's a union of the variety, you want to take a finitely many cells and to both constructibility and then the representation also with the finitely generated module or your ground ring, so if the ring is not good then you have to know what to say. Yes, so let's, let's be safe here. So uh, f for this formulation, let's, th let's take field coefficients, just, just to be on the safe side. So in this case, I'll take really constructible perverse sheaves, so they live on finite, kind of they're supported on finite dimensional pieces, and here I'll, take, I'll just take finite dimensional representations. Yeah, so this theorem is due to many people, so kind of if the initial input came from Lustig, then uh, I believe it was conjectured by Drinfeld, and then it was proved by Ginzburg with uh, coefficients in characteristic zero and by Mir Mirkovich villain in, in co with coefficients in arbitrary ring. All right, and, okay. Mm. All right, so now, uh, so this talk is about generalizing, rather deforming this equivalence. So this equivalence, as stated, has the following drawbacks. So first of all, it does not extend to the derived level. So namely, instead of perverse sheaves, let's consider the, the derived category. So my notation for the derived category, I don't like to write D, I like, I write sheaves. So and when I... When I write sheaves, I mean that derived category. So I consider the equivariant derived category in the affine Grassmannian. But then which find this condition? Yeah, I'll, in a second. Because it is important to allow infinite things, sometimes it's open. Yes, and I, I will say that in a moment. So we will be in allowing infinite, infinite things. So Let me say, okay, so at some point I'll have to adopt this convention, and I may, may as well do it now. I put no finite, I, I put no finiteness conditions. Just, it's the un, unbounded derived category. Right. No, but you see, uh, if you want uh, any infinite thing to be a direct limit of things supported on the finite constructive thing, like for usual, uh, so you have sheaves which are supported on the on the <coughs> on union of uh, uh, closures of five element objects so of this, uh, but you can never see if like the constant shift. For example, take the constant shift C on the, on the Grassmannian. Is it a shift in your sense? We'll I'll address this point in exactly five minutes. I'll I will I will talk about this in great detail in in, in just a few minutes. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, we'll I'll introduce what, what I mean in a, in a moment, just notationally, so because this is my notation for the derived category, whenever I talk about a billion category, I'll put a little heart. So here, this was an, <laughs> well, it's the heart of the T-structure, so in this notation, this meant an equivalence of abelian categories, and so w without the heart it would mean the derived category, and one may want to compare the equivariant derived category in the fine Grassmannian with the derived category, Rebjicek, and even if your coefficients are characteristic zero, these are not at all equivalent. So you can explicitly say what this thing is, and it's not that, it's something else. So, so the that is to say that this is, it's a kind of fragile statement, it only take, it only happens at the, uh, at the abelian level. So another point is, and again this is kind of the main direction of this talk, is that as we will s see in about half an hour, that, um, <coughs> so the right hand side admits a quantum deformation, so namely, 
there is such a thing as representations of the quantum group. And you may try to deform the left hand side, but again, this equivalence, even at the abelian level, will completely fail. So, And so the first thing that I'll do, I'll, I'll replace this equivalence before any quantum deformation by another one that is better, and what, not, I don't want to qualify things, um, by an equivalence that will hold at the derived level and one that will admit a quantum deformation. All right, so... Okay, specifically to address uh, Ofer's question, let me say what I mean by the category of sheaves. So we take as an input uh, the, th the theory of sheaves on uh, algebraic varieties of, uh, of finite type. So if y is an algebraic variety of finite type, to it we assign something that called sheaves of y, and so, basically, for now, the only functoriality that we need is the following, that if you have y1 mapping to y2, what I need is, well, shriek pullback functor. But is it the, the weak and derived category or some infinity? <coughs> So, is it a, a, a up, upper shriek? Ah, upper shriek. Thank yeah. You. Yes. So, for the particular story that I'll I'll talk about, one can make do with without higher categories, but it's again it's very fragile. So, better right away perceive this as as the corresponding. A uh, high categorical enhancement of the derived category, and now, so now we are in the in the finite dimensional situation. And let me say here that uh, well, I so I, sh I should technically specify what I mean. So what I mean is the following: in the world of D modules, I take the entire unbounded category of mm, of D modules, so no finiteness conditions. So in the world of constructible sheaves, what I do is this. Again, it's a technical remark, so feel free to ignore it. I take the usual constructible category and I'll pass to what's called the incompletion. Is it just for sheaves or the derived category? The, the derived category. So I, I have the, um, again, in the constructible world, I have the, the um, higher category, well, higher categorical en enhancement of the constructible derived category. Of the bounded one of the bounded constructible category, the kind yes. of the usual one, and then I take it what's called the end completion. Is, is it different from the unbounded, unconstructible? Data? It is different, yes. It is different. But only was, like, was, was torsion coefficient, it's the same, right? Yes, but I... Yes. You want? QL coefficients. So, in Q, with Q, let's say if I work with QL coefficients, yes. I do the following thing. I, I take the constructible category, and take its end completion. But, but in the topological world, I'll do the same. I'll, I'll start with a constructible category as it is. Algebraically constructible. Yes, and then I'll take its end completion. So usually you consider complexes with only constructible cohomology. Yes. This is what you do. Yes. And for D modules, you take complexes with, with quasi coherent cohomology. No, for D modules, I can do either of the following two things. For D modules, what I can do, I can do straight away, I can take the unbounded derived category with no coherence conditions. Or... No quasi-coherence even? Oh, of course quasi-coherence. So no, as I said, quasi-coherent all module cohomology. Yes, quasi-coherent, yeah. Quasi-coherent, yes. Mm -hmm. But the object themselves don't have to be quasi-coherent. This is a point. Maybe in many cases you can do it, but it's not. Yeah. All right. So, 
So now let me specify what I mean by sheaves on something like the affine Grassmannian. So the affine Grassmannian can be written as a union of an increasing family, well, of closed sub schemes, each of which is a scheme of finite type. Let me see. So it's an ordered set. And if you have this, then you have this closed embedding. And so the derived cat so the category of sheaves in the Fine Grassmannian is by definition well I should write it like this. It's the So in other words, you should think of a object of the category of sheaves on the, the affine Grassmannian as a compatible family of objects on each of these y alphas and compatible in the sense of shriek pullbacks. They shriek pull back to each other. So that's the definition. Again, uh, well, there are time constraints. Otherwise, I would be able to explain why this is exactly what you want. But on the representation side, any representation is a unit five-dimensional representation. Okay, so this is okay. And here you are doing inversely matrix is okay. So let me let me so okay let me let me make let me add this comment. Okay. Okay, it's a it's a general useful observation, but it's very useful. So let me say it like this. Suppose you have a family of categories indexed by some set, so as C alpha, C beta. And there are functors. And uh, let me symbolically denote these functors by L like this. And suppose it so happens that these functors actually admit left adjoints. And I'll denote them, which is exactly what is happening in this case because these are closed embeddings. So in this case, there is a general lemma, which I learned from Luri, and it says the following that the limit of the inverse family under these functors is canonically equivalent to the co-limit of the direct family. One, there's a tiny remark one has to add here, namely... Do you assume that the large shriek guys are fully faithful? No. It's, it's completely general. So, there it's, so therefore, you can think of this resulting category in, well, either as compatible family under shriek pullbacks, or you can think of objects there as coming, well, if you wish, as co-limits of objects that come from individuals, individual C alphas. Through the lower shriek. Through the low, yeah, through the push forwards. Mm -hmm. uh, so and this is... Like what I said. This is like what you said before. And this is an explanation why this is exactly what you want. You want to think of the sheaves on the entire thing as constructed from sheaves on finite dimensional pieces. So this presentation gives uh, that point of view. The limit is fixed one. It this happens. It doesn't matter for the. It doesn't matter for this claim, but in this case, it happens to be filtered. Okay, so here you you work, you may work with usual categories and then the usual two limits and two co-limits in the two category categories. You may also work in your higher setup. No, so this is this happens in the higher in the higher world. Not in the. Does it happen in the world of usual categories? You mean you mean usual meaning triangulated categories? No, no, just uh, a billion kinds of categories without structure. This makes sense without putting structure on the categories. Uh, is it true without putting uh, any? Uh, y yes, this is true because a abst abstractly a category yes. is a particular case of infinity category. However, one has to be careful, namely, if, if the f index set is not filtered, when you, if, you, if you're taking a co-limit of abstract categories, you may, of just categories, you may end up with a higher category. So if the, cate if the family of indices is filtered, then you will stay within ordinary categories. Ah, but I, I, I still don't see, because in the co-limit, every object comes from a given one. No, so it's, so one has to be again. <laughs> so the it's the union of the C alpha with some morphisms which you add. To you. So in the field of case you need to discuss. So this doesn't seem to be big enough to. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll say in a moment. 
So again, this is a technical discussion that... Okay, so what I wanted to say is this, that so which world are we in? We are in the world of categories that admit all co-limits. And this co-limit is taking place in that world. So, uh, so it's co-limit, again, taken in the world of categories with all co-limits. You can explicitly describe it as follows. If these categories are compactly generated, but now are they triangulated? They have some extra structure. What kind of categories do you look at? Are they oh. presentable, stable, or so, what are they? So, yeah. so that's a statement about presentable, stable, and infinity categories. This is. This is a statement about presentable and uh, stable presentable cat infinity categories. I'm going to say commuters call them it. Stably presentable, what did you say? <laughs> 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 All right. Okay, so precise statement. Uh, uh, so these functors necessarily commute with co-limits because they're the left adjoints and you, you don't need anything else. Uh, So we are taking we are taking the limits and co-limits in the ambient world of well, let me call them DG categories yeah. with that contain all co-limits. And let me just say one remark. But what are what are functors in this in this infinity category? Are there functors that commute as co-limits? <laughs> so in this category. Let me, say, let me assume, for simplicity, that we take the functors that commit with all co-limits, and in this case, I'll... So... Okay, I want to simplify things. Let's, let's, take that we, let's assume that, let's say that we take functors that commit with co-limits. In this case, we require that both of these commute with all co-limits. Mm -hmm. Although, this can be made, that can be relaxed. Okay. Yeah. So, let me just say, address Opfer's question. So, precisely in this setting, suppose these categories are compactly generated, like in our case. We take some small category and we, our C alpha is, is obtained as int completion of this, some category of compact objects. So then you can describe this co-limit taken in the world of categories with all co-limits as follows. You take the co-limit in the world of small categories and then you take it into completion. So, in this world, ev and suppose also the cat for some places the category of indices is filtered, in this world, every object is really, really comes for some particular alpha. But in this world, I, I'm allowing taking um, co limits of those. So, in other words, in, when I'm form forming this, I'm taking, I'm really taking co-limits of objects, each of which comes from, from C alpha. As we do in the, in the representation theoretic side. All right, so that was um, a useful digression about the nature of categories. No, it's really useful, otherwise we don't know what we're talking about. All right. <coughs> so now I want to introduce, well, the desired modification of the left-hand side. So let me first introduce the symbol for it. I call it the Whittaker category in the Feingrassmannian. So, and so let me say what it will be. So, and then I'll decipher the definition. So, it's sheaves on the Feingrassmannian in the sense that I just introduced, but we're taking sheaves that are equivariant against maximal unipotent against a non-degenerate character chi. So I'll decipher all, I'll decipher what this means in a, in a minute. And it will be actually a full subcategory in the initial category. So I should add the warning here that usually when you talk about the equivariant category, the forgetful the functor of forgetting the equivariance is, is not fully faithful. But because here we're dealing with a group which is essentially unipotent, this uh, forgetful functor will be, will be fully faithful. So, uh, so this definition may look non-obvious for the following reason, that, well, as we just discussed here, our 
objects of our category are essentially of finite dimensional nature. So the, there are co-limits of, of sheaves with finite dimensional support. But here we are imposing an equivariance condition with respect to a group such that its orbits are infinite dimensional. So we are kind of inherently dealing with objects with an infinite dimensional support. So here is some care, well, we need to take some, we need to be cautious when giving this definition. So I'll give the definition, and then the question will be, why does this category have any objects? And we'll, we'll discuss it in a moment. So what do I mean by this? So first of all, because the group N is unipotent, you can write uh, this group in scheme as an increasing union of uh, group schemes and I. So, for example, in the, in the case of SL2, this will be just the group of uh, Laurent series, and here we'll be taking Laurent series with a bounded degree of pole. So, whatever this equivariance condition is, This will be, again, it will be a full subcategory here, and it will be obtained as the intersection of the subcategories when, where I impose the equivariance with respect to this increasing family of subgroups. So equivariance for the big group is just an intersection, well, it just impose equivariance with respect to all, all of the subgroups. So now I'll have to say what each of these categories is. So, <coughs> well, as, I, as we discussed here, the fine Grassmannian itself is a union of uh, uh, fine dimensional schemes, and for each fixed NI, I can assume that all of my Y alphas are. Uh, are preserved by, by the action of Ni. So we'll define this as basically by the same procedure as here. It will be the inverse limit under Schwick pullbacks of sheaves on each of these Y alphas with the equivariance condition. So, and now we are almost in the finite dimensional situation, except that these groups are not of finite type. But each of this n, but so, I have this ni acting on y alpha, and this action factors through some group which is already an algebraic group of finite type, with the kernel being pro unipotent. And so, and finally, I. S It's by definition the equivariance condition with respect to this quotient. <coughs> so, and I'll say in, in a moment what, what I mean by this. But here we are in a finite dimensional situation. So we have, mm, we have, well, finite dimensional algebraic variety and an algebraic group acting on it. So now what I mean by equivariance? So, for me, so this there is no prime. This yes. this is the prime. Yes. So this was infinite dimensional, and I define it in terms of the finite dimensional quotient. All right. So let's pause for a second, and so let me just decipher what this means in the finite dimensional situation. <coughs> so. Suppose, well, let me call it n prime. Suppose n prime is an algebraic group that acts on some y. And what do I mean by this chi? So chi is a homomorphism of algebraic groups from, from to the additive group. And so let me assume that n prime is unipotent as it is here. So, so 
So now we have to be a little bit more specific about the sheaf theory. So suppose that we are either in the world of D modules or we are over a finite field. So in the world of D modules, on GA there exists what's called the exponential D module, and in over a finite field there exists an Artin Schreier sheaf over GA. So let me call them in both cases exponential. So it's a particular sheaf on GA. So now this equivariance, so it's a full subcategory and it consists of all those objects F that have the following property. It's not extra structure, but property. So, so let me write it and then I'll write and explain what this notation means. Where act is the action map of the group on my y. So what I want is that when I pull back my sheaf onto the product with respect to the action, it splits as a product of what I had along y and the exponential. And so the tiny remark is that because n prime was unipotent, if this homomorphism exists, it's, it's unique, and moreover, all the higher compatibilities, whatever they are, are satisfied automatically. Just a moment. So for a small homomorphism, as far as I remember, in the usual theory, the logic of back and anyway, the upper shriek is involves a pullback, shift, and a twist, but there is a shift. And so the shift uh, does not seem to be, because this is like a definition you would do, do with upper star, but with upper shriek. It depends which cohomological degree you put the exponential in. No, but if the spa if smooth space is infinite dimensional, like here, the... the, the but it's, it, no, it's finite dimensional. We're already in the finite dimensional situation. You forgot to pull back by kind. Pardon me? You forgot to pull back by kind. Because x is on GA. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and also the exponential itself would be, you may have to put it. Yeah, it's, I put it in the same cohomological degree as the dualizing sheaf. All right, so this is what you literally do if your sheaf theory is D modules or if you are a finite field. But what, so, <coughs> but in this talk I want to be, as I said, on the Betty side and I actually want to work over complex numbers with sheaves in the classical topology where this will not literally make sense. So well, now I'll explain the remedy, how to make sense of this exponential uh, um, well, when you don't have, but when you don't have the exponential, so it's based on the following trick. So I call it the passage from Whittaker model to Kirillov model, although I'm not sure the, it's the terminology is very accurate. So let's consider the following situation. So, so suppose you have a, again a variety y, on which just the group GA acts. So I'll consider basically a baby model of this and it will be quite easy to see how to combine this with what I said before to produce an actual definition. So in this situation we can talk about Whittaker of Y, again by definition I mean sheaves on Y, which are and where chi is the identity map from GA to itself. So this makes sense. But so, but now I would, and again, this definition makes use of the exponential object on GA. So, but now I would like to replace this definition by something else that does not involve the exponential. So, and, but you need an extra structure on Y, and that stru extra structure is the following, that instead of just having an action of GA, we'll have an action with a semi-direct product. 
suppose you have this acting on Y, where GM acts on GA in the standard way. So in this case, I'll introduce something I'll call the Kirillov model of Y, and it's the following. It's a full <laughs> subcategory inside sheaves on Y, which are GM equivariant, and it consists of the following objects, that these are those objects such that if I average them against GA, so there are two kinds of averaging, Shriek and star, I'll use star, you get zero. Well, it's another category, so there are two forget, well, let's say you have Whitaker of Y, it sits as a full subcategory inside sheaves of Y, there's a Kirillov of Y. Now the, the geometry variant thing is done relative to upper shrek or upper star? Uh, just, just How do you define geometry variance in using upper star or upper shrek? Do you have to do, do you need to work into its simplicity? Yes. So first of all, shrek and star don't matter, I, either or, according to what you said, because the two pullbacks differ by a cohomological shift. Yes. So, but now, yes, GM is not unipotent, and when you define that, you, it's the high-tech definition. So you, you need some the simplicity. Yes. Yeah. Same satisfying. Yes. Cohomological distance. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so we have these two categories, but now there is a general lemma that says that there exists a canonical equivalence as abstract categories. Abstract meaning they're not at all the same as subcategories here that sit very differently, but abstractly they're they are equivalent. And the two equivalences are, are, so let me just say, the diagram does not commute. That's what I'm trying to emphasize. There. Yeah, the two entities are equivalent. Let me say what the functor is in this direction. It's the functor, you take Whittaker sheaf and you, um, you star average it with respect to GM. <coughs> and so, as, and you, as you can see, in the Skirilov model, you, never, you no longer mention the exponential, and so that definition makes sense, uh, well, of an arbitrary ground field. And So let me. So you pull back to GM called the spec, and you pull back by upper star and lower and push forward by lower star. Or yes. Pull back? Yes. 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 Okay. Star averaging. It's the functor right adjoint to the forgetful functor uh, of functor forgetting the GM equivariance. <coughs> and so by combining these ideas, you can see that in our case there is this extra GM basically that comes from the torus, you can give the Kirillov style m category here. And so the definition actually makes sense. However, I'll continue writing Whittaker. Uh, but again, so you should think of Kirillov as the, as the definition. All right. Whoa, it was a long time. All right. So in particular, we should think this action, uh, this category is an action by the torus? Which one? The, 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 uh, you said you're going to write it, but we should think of it as the No, the original category had an action of the torus. Yeah. <coughs> and then I used this torus action to, what, which is like here, you see? Yes. Why I had an action of the torus, uh -huh. and I could do two things. I could take just Whitaker and n no longer have any action, or I can use this GM action to write Kirillov. <coughs> just 
Like a philosophical question, the Vitika implicitly seems to depend on the choice of, of his character Kai, but the Kirillov doesn't depend, seem to depend on such a choice. So in the Kirillov, you're saying Kirillov does, does not seem to depend on the choice. Right. Yes, indeed. So suppose you are in this situation, then suppose you have two characters that are conjugate but element of, by an element of GM. So it's easy to see that the corresponding Whittaker categories are equivalent, specifically by means of the action by that element of GM. So if you wish, in this situation, Whittaker also explicitly does not depend on the choice of chi. Yeah? But for geometric language, at some point the choice of chi should matter. No. And that's a remark that I forgot. I'll, I'll add it right now. So, so, as Peter is saying, is that, so my definition seems to depend on the, ch well, on the choice of chi. So what was this chi? So I said it was supposed to be, yeah, so I didn't specify what chi was. So now let me say what chi was. Okay. So it's a, it was supposed to be a character to GA. And I said it was non-degenerate, but which, which one do I mean? So first of all, it's a character. Therefore, it factors through the committant. And if you take the unipotent, maximal unipotent modulo, it's committant. It's canonically the product of copies of GA according to vertices of the Dinkin diagram. So, <coughs> all right. So, and now, okay, so now you apply this sum map, just is sum over all vertices. And now comes an ugly step. Well, you'll want homomorphism from Laurent series to GA. And, well, the ugly way to say it, you will say, okay, I'll take the coefficient next to t, min t, negative, t to the negative 1. But that involves a choice, choice of coordinate, and that's not something we want to do. So we want, to do, we want a more canonical procedure. So the thing would be canonical if instead of, well, this is basically Laurent series. So this procedure would be canonical if instead of Laurent series we had Laurent 1 forms. Then the residue would be canonical. And so this is what we want to do. And for this, we modif so to do this, we modify our picture a little bit. So we, so to have a canonical residue, we twist everything. So namely, as I said, so we have a curve x, and over curve, well, implicitly we were considering the constant group scheme G. But instead of that, we'll twist G by the adjoint action of the torus using a specific um, T torsor. So which one? Well, how do you get T torsors? You can start with a line bundle and use a co-character. So we'll, as a low line bundle, we choose once and for all a square root of the canonical bundle on the curve, and we'll use the co-character to row. So this is, so this is the t t t torso. So two row is homomorphism from GM to my torus. So I start with a line bundle, which is a torsor for GM. I induce and I get a torsor for T. So, and if you perform this twist, then you will see that, well, unipotent group will also get twisted. And you will see that these Laurent series will, be, will get replaced by one forms. So in this sense, the procedure becomes canonical. All right. All right. 
So. Can you look what you are going to see? What you yeah. So I choose a square root of the canonical bundle on the curve. Yes. It's a line bundle, i.e. GM torsor. Yes. And I, I use two rows homomorphism from GM to the torus. I induce the torsor, I get a T torsor on, uh, on the curve. So then I have, a, I have my group scheme G, yes. and I use the adjoint action of the torus on my group to to get um, a non-constant group scheme, namely I twist my... Yes. <coughs> so if you do this, if, and if you consider the corresponding version of the affine Grassmannian, then this character becomes canonical, <coughs> because you, your unipotent gets twisted by this row. So basically, root subgroups will no longer look like Laurent series, they will look like one forms. And row is a sort of simple root. Row, which, which doesn't exist. Okay. Yeah, 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 oh, simple co weights. Yes. But it may not exist as a co weight, but two row does. And for that reason, I need to choose. Say again? How does chi even enter in the definition of the Kirillov model? Or does it just not enter in the definition? So you're asking... So it's that GM that will... will okay. Let's postpone this because we'll... we'll All right, so, so let me make a few remarks. So we might not even get to the quantum situation, but at least I'll say this story properly. Uh, uh, so, so I gave the definition of Whitaker, but so you can ask, well, why is this category non-empty? And so let me make an argument that, in fact, it is kind of empty, and then I, make an, then I explain that it's actually non-empty. So if you consider the category in the fine Grassmannian, or any in scheme, so this <coughs> category has a T-structure. So namely, an object is declared to be cohomologically greater or equal than zero if and only if, well, remember, <laughs> um, remember, an object here is a compatible family of objects on what I call Y alphas under shriek pullbacks. So and we can think of this, this compatible family as shriek restrictions of F to the corresponding Y alphas. So we say that an object is cohomologically greater or equal than zero if and only if all of these restrictions are cohomologically greater or equal than zero. And when I talk about the t-structure on the particular y alpha, I mean the perverse t-structure. So now you can <coughs> prove the following general <coughs> simple lemma that every object f in this Whitaker category is cohomologically trivial. So, <coughs> it's an epidemic spreading here. Uh, so, we, so I said this category has a t-structure and for that reason for every object it makes sense to take its individual cohomologies. I'm saying that for every object in my Whitaker category all of its cohomologies are zero. However, the trick here is that, so the t-structure here is what's called non-separated. There are objects that, non-zero objects, such that all of whose cohomologies are zero, but the object itself is non-zero. A typical example of such is the dualizing sheaf. So, 
Um, so, it's, and... So how does the dualizing sheet look like? I'll, I'll say in a moment. What does it mean cohomologically? Cohomologically trivial means that, well, we have a T structure for every object and take its individual cohomologies, they will all vanish. And so let me say that this is one of those, so I learned two main things from Jacob Lurie. One was, well, to operate with infinity categories, but here this is not what's going on. Another thing that I learned from him is basically how to take care of negative infinity. And that actually already appeared in Peter's talk in response to Ofer's question about sheaves being sheaves of hypersheaves. So, well, before I met Jacob, I would write this mysterious symbol DB of some category, and I, would, I was hoping that this mysterious letter B would basically take care of things. That basically I, was, I kind of had this belief that you writing DB is kind of, it's some kind of rule of hygiene, and if, and if you observe this rule, if you just write it meticulously, you will not get sick and everything will be fine. But then I, but then, so, adopted a new point of view that, so, being, b being hygienic, you're trying to get rid of some bacteria, but some of these bacteria are really helpful. And, <laughs> and these bacteria live at cohomological negative infinity, and that they give rise to a lot of mathematics. So, if you were to work with bounded derived categories, you will never see this Whitaker category. Okay, but now let me give you, give, an an example of this object, also answering Peter's question. So here the biggest liquid is always in the perverse sense. Perverse. On, on finite dimensional pieces. That is, uh, okay. Okay, sorry. <coughs> so, so let me give an example of an object. This is the basic object there. So let's consider the orbit of the of the unit point of the fine Grassmannian by means of the unipotent group. And it's usually called S0. And let's denote by I the local well, it's it's also an in ind scheme, and this is ind locally closed embedding. So the sky gives rise to a map to GA and all right, so, so now I'll write a scary symbol on the board and I'll try to decipher it. So I take the following object in the category of sheaves on S0. I take chi up a shriek of the exponential. So what do I mean by this? Well, that's an example of an object which is, well, if it was not exponential, if I took the dualizing sheaf, that would be the dualizing. So what do I mean by this? Well, S0 itself is a union of finite dimensional pieces, and as we said, the category on S0 is this inverse limit. When I say dualizing, well, I was suppo I'm supposed to specify objects on each of the finite dimensional pieces that construct as comprise S0, and I take the dualizing, and this dualizing tautologically shrieked restrict to each other. And, well, the same happens for any shriek pullback. So that's what this guy is. And so let me just note the basic object delta zero. It'll be, sorry. Of this guy. Where I lower shriek is the left adjoint, which a priori is partially defined to the functor i upper shriek that is always defined in our category. But in this, well, you have to prove that on this particular object, this left adjoint is defined. Why is it partially defined? Well, you have a functor. It may or may not ad admit left adjoint. This left adjoint is defined on some objects. But you assumed in your general setup that you have those, ah, in the CR for discussion, there were the lower shriek. But this is not a part of this. this is a locally closed it's a locally closed embedding. So let, let's say in the world of D modules, yeah. where we have non-holonomic guys, lower chic may not be defined on all objects. But in the Betty side? In the Betty side, it's always defined. 
And moreover, you can do the same, um, produce objects what I call delta lambda, where lambda is a dominant co-weight. So it's a usual trick, well, familiar to people in automorphic forms, that you can do it So, if lambda is a dominant coweight, the sky gives rise to a map from S alpha, where this is the orbit by means of the unipotent of, well, I hope you know what I mean by this. It's a point in the loop group that corresponds to coweight lambda. And the T is my notation for the coordinate on the formal disk. So, so it will be kind of S0. And you need some chronological shift here. So, so I said that the objects of my category are chronologically trivial, yet when I view them as objects in the ambient category. Yet, one can prove the following. Why that so you can ask, so, so you want homomorphism like this, which is equivariant with respect to the given homomorphism um, chi on n. And it exists if and only if lambda is dominant. It's kind of usual game in kasselmann schleicher -like formula. So lemma, so please pay attention, there exists a T structure on Whitaker, let me say, such that an object F is cohomologically greater than equal than zero if and only if home for all lambda all. So you can create a T-structure on my category, which is, so to say, generated by this object delta lambda. So again, from the point of view of the initial T-structure, my, all of my objects are trivial, yet this, what's taken on its own, the category that I obtained has its own T-structure, uh, generated by this object delta lambda. So now I'm out of time, so we didn't get to any Q, but let me, but at least I can state a theorem. So the theorem says this, that, and this, is, this theorem is true, again, in any of the shift theoretic contexts. So my desire to state on the Betty side had to do with Q deformation, but we didn't get there. The theorem is that there exists an equivalence of categories, and that happens at the derived level, which is T exact. So the category representations has its usual T structure, and the Whitaker category is the, has the T structure defined right here. And moreover, under this equivalence, these objects delta lambda go over, well, to the usual irreducibles. Note that lambdas were dominant co-weights for G, which is the same as dominant weights for G-check. So kind of the level of parameters that makes sense. And now in the D model setup, so the, <coughs> uh, there are all usually people who are isonomic or anomic regular, and, and there are also big, big quasi coherent D models. Yeah. Not just, they are coherent, which are not autonomic, of course. So yeah. now, in re on the representation side, only reducible representation correspond to nice things. 
Well, I don't know, but how can it be that you can allow non autonomic yeah. So what happens is that in this case, yes. the objects of my Whittaker category yes. are automatically in the holonomic. It happens automatically. Well, basically for the following reason that, well, on each orbit of n of k, yes. well, your all of your objects are yeah, because of the equivariance. Yeah, because of the equivariance. Yes, the, the in holodomist is forced on you by the equivariance condition. Can you? And how does this work with the monoidal structures? Does the left hand side automatically yeah. carry a symmetric monoidal structure? Yeah, yeah. So one second. So the, 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 this is this question that I wanted to comment on. Let, let me see. There's a few more. Just one moment. When you take the heart, you, you get the. That's point number two. Uh, and there is also point number. Okay. Okay, now I already forgot your question. So what was it? <laughs> Monodial. Monodial. Okay. Can we so I'm over time. Can we declare it over and then this these will be questions? This is a question period. It's question period. You didn't <laughs> All right. So that's okay, monoidal structure. So as stated, this is just an equivalence of stable infinity categories. It's interesting, but there are more interesting things to say. So namely, this is indeed a symmetric monoidal category, and you would like to see the, the structure here. So unlike the usual gemetic satake where we had convolution, this is not even naturally monoidal category. So, and here one enters a new world, and that of factorization categories. So, what you, so as we saw, this category was attached to a point on the curve, and there is another, the whole new structure there. So, we allow this, well, we put, we allow these categories at a moving point, and in fact, at multiple moving points, and that's what makes this what's called a factorization category. Now, every symmetric monoidal category also gives rise to, to a factorization category. And so the actual theorem is that we have an equivalence of factorization categories. So I should say that what that captures is not the symmetric monoidal structure here, but the braided monoidal structure here. It actually makes difference at the infinity level. So you recover rep G as a braided monoidal category. So that's that was that question. Now, Luke's question is this. So, let me juxtapose it with the previous equivalence. So, here we had this... Um, let, let me write a slightly more complete answer to your question, okay? So, I don't want to work at the abelian level. I want. So you have this entire what's called spherical category. And, well, this category acts by convolutions on, on just sheaves in the affine Grassmannian, preserving any kind of equivariance that you put on the left. See, this, this is really a monoidal category that acts here. And in this monoidal structure, this monoidal action is in addition to this factorization structure. So now let me tell you what it corresponds to on the, on the right hand side. So as I said, this category is not equivalent to rep check, it's equivalent to something else. So let me tell you what it's equivalent to. So this is, well, quasi-co, but you need this int co correction on the following, I'm sorry to say, dg stack. It's point times point over, it's a fiber product of a point scheme times point scheme over the Lie algebra divided by the adjoint action of G-check. Whereas this should be thought of quasi-co of point times G-check. So because this is a derived scheme whose underlying derived stack with underlying <laughs> classical stack is just point more G-check, the heart of the T-structure is exactly that. 
And so and that's why in originally, when you pass through the heart of this structure, you see that the perverse sheaves are equivalent to Rebjic check. Mm -hmm. But at the drive level, you see the whole thing. So we have an action of this, and it corresponds to the natural action of this on this. So basically, you have y times quasi coherent sheaves on y times y over x always acts on quasi coherent sheaves on y. It's the usual convolution action. So this is the pattern. That's how things fit. All right. Uh, these were two questions, and there is one more question that nobody asked, but I wanted to comment on. <laughs> so, so, and the question is, do you really have to go that big to have this equivalence? Do you really have to do Whittaker? Do you, want, do you really have to do equivariance with respect to this huge thing, N of K? The answer is yes and no. So if you are at a fixed point, you will be able to replace N of K by something much, much smaller. In fact, by many things that are much smaller. And I'll tell you by what. But this kind of description will not be compatible with factorization. So if you want factorization, you really need n of k, because n of k is the, the object that factorizes. So let me tell you what you can replace n of k by. So in fact, you have many choices, one for each natural number. So you can replace them by some subgroup that I'll call i sub n. So let me tell you what i sub n is in the particular case of SL2. So n is greater than equal than 1. For SL2, it looks like this. It's um, subgroup of matrices, A, B, here it will be T to the minus N, C, T to the, no, uh, T to the minus N, C, T to the 2 N, C, D, where A, B, C, D are in O. So you make the positive part larger and larger than grows and the negative part smaller and smaller. And each, such, each of these subgroups also has a homomorphism chi into GA, and you can play the same game, imposing equivariance, and the resulting category will be just, well, will be the same as Whittaker. So, in other words, you can have a purely finite dimensional model for this, for this Whittaker category.